welcome to BB Book Buzz. This is the November edition of the show in which your baby librarians gather together to talk about books that we have been reading recently and hopes that we can help you find your next great read. My name is Karen Stern I'm from the Reference Desk and I have two of my colleagues here, Bridget Black, also from the Reference Desk, and our IT wizard, Alyssa Staples. Um, and we have quite a variety today. We have some nonfiction, we have some contemporary fiction, and we have a historical fiction. And we're going to start with Bridget, who's got our nonfiction All essays. Right. Yeah. So I am I'm going to talk about Gia Tolentino's first essay collection, Trick Mirror, uh, with the subtitle Reflections on Self Delusion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I so this she so. Uh, Tolentino is a staff writer for The New Yorker, and you've probably seen her online. She writes a lot, so she's very prolific. So this is her first, like, book collection, though. And they're all original essays, so it's not, like, repackaged things. It's all things she wrote for, this, for, the, for the book. Uh, so I say that this is an example of a genre of books primarily about the problem of being a woman, <laughs> which isn't to say <laughs> problems you have because you are a woman, but just that existing in the world as a woman <laughs> is a problem. <laughs> uh, which is, can feel true a lot of the time. Uh, so it's, and she isn't really offering solutions to this. She's just elucidating the problems mm -hmm. and the way it feels, which can feel very nice because it's sort of to say, you know how you feel bad all the time? Well, there's a reason for that. And it's not just mm. because of you. It's because of the way society is constructed right. and the way you live in general is, is controlled by all of these forces that don't really allow you to be fulfilled. Right. It helps when someone tells you it's not your fault all Ex the time. <laughs> exactly. Like It really helps when someone says to you, it's not your fault that you feel bad and then you still do these things that make you feel bad. Right. You don't have another option. Uh, there's a She writes this great essay called Always Be Optimizing, which is a lot about sort of being a woman is has always throughout history been a, been a task of optimizing your self-worth, your self-actions, all of these things. The way you look. The way you yeah. look. Mm -hmm. That women are uniquely attuned to this mm -hmm. process and that the world of now just amplifies it and mm -hmm. has in some ways made men also join this optimization right, absolutely. goal. But the way women do it mm -hmm. experiences it even worse and more intensely and right. often the sort of gendered criticism of it is on women, particularly mm -hmm. things like Instagram influencers who are using all of those skills of optimization to make money. But the idea that that's not a job, that's not something that you can do. Or it's shameful it's, in some way. Yes, <laughs> that by you. So, and she really expresses these things very well. And she doesn't have a solution for that. Like her solution in in like the essay about the internet is basically <laughs> the only way to solve this is if we didn't have the internet, so it's like right. societal collapse. I there's a lot of qu problems that could be solved if we didn't have the internet, yeah. Yeah, but we do. She we literally do. says, I am now not going to have the page, group, but that, that like the only solution is the uh, destruction of like, societal collapse, complete <laughs> overriding everything that we do. So or, it's a hopeful book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's, this is what it is. It's, what could put an end to the worst of the internet? Social and economic collapse would do it. Or perhaps a series of antitrust cases followed by a package of hard regulatory legislation that would somehow also dismantle the internet's fundamental profit model. At this point, it's clear that collapse will almost definitely mm -hmm. come first. <laughs> and I think that that's sort of, a, which is like, these are not situations that you created. Mm. These are, this is the way the world is and you have to live your life within in the structures. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's, it's a very interesting way. And I think that these essays are funny and joyful. Being honest about the way the world is doesn't mean you have to be defeated, even mm. if you don't think that there's necessarily a solution. Right. You still have to live your life. You still have to do these things. You gotta laugh. Yeah, and you gotta laugh. And I, I think that it, on one level, as I said, it just, it, it really helped me because it makes you feel less crazy. <laughs> 
Right. Like connecting with other women can be the answer in itself. Yes. That like having people say, no, the reason why you feel bad is not mm. because you... You are bad. Yeah, because yeah. you are bad or because you don't go to, you know, you didn't eat salad or you don't go to exercise. It's or because you're not working hard <laughs> enough. It's because society is constructed in a way that will never let you be fulfilled. Right. And being able to then have that perspective lets you step back from it. Yes. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I see. And, and that's some of them are about contemporary life. My personal favorite essay is actually not is ties back into contemporary life, but is actually it's called Pure Heroines. And it's about um, childhood literature, liter like literary heroines, oh, cool. specifically heroines who are little girls. So not adult. She talks about adult heroines and why they are sort of less satisfying as mm. characters, mm. but specifically about, about young women. And she takes on sort of the classics of, of the genre, which is Anne mm -hmm. of Man of Green Gables, Green Gables right. and Laura Ingalls Wilder, right. um, Harriet the Spy mm. and Anastasia Krupnik, uh, Ramona from Ramona and Beats. Like yep. these are all, yeah, sort of ones that you understand and and feel. And I I really liked that essay because I was also a big reader and I also loved all those childhood all those, yeah. heroines. So um, reading about her and then she goes into adult people and talks about Alina Ferrante too. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to read one little part of that essay, which is both nice but also still kind of depressing in its yeah. way which is why she says this is part of the reason these childhood characters are all so independent so eager to make the most of whatever presents itself they or more to the point their creators understand that adulthood is always looming which means marriage and children which means in effect the end mm -hmm. because she's talking about how all of those narratives end mm -hmm. before, before they they're are, married they or are with a marriage that's right before or with a marriage up. that's right yeah. true. so i read this collection too and i really liked that essay as well and I do like the fact that it is kind of timeless, and she goes through so many like decades of, of literature. The one criticism I'd have on that same vein against some of the other ones is that they're so rooted so firmly in right now. I don't know how it's going to age, like in 15 years. Yes, I feel the same way about some of them, particularly I think the internet one is a nice time capsule of internet today, mm -hmm. but it could we could see it might it might change without societal collapse. It probably will change. Yeah, in so some way. So that's the that's the and and I also enjoyed reality TV me, which is a very personal essay yeah, about how she was on a reality show as a teenager. Wow. So that that one is you know that's memoir, so that will last. But I do think there are some that definitely are are very today. Right. It's kind of like. It's downfall and it's magic because they are so now that when you read it, it feels so it, more like pressing. Like, I don't know, it just you relate to it on such a like, yes, visceral level because it's happening all around you right at this moment. But it can go right. both ways. Maybe she needs to write this book again in 10 years and, yeah. and you know, we <laughs> exactly. can all compare them. Compare yeah, them and I think, I think she will. Like, that's yeah. the kind right. of thing that's I think that she she's, yeah. she's going to keep doing this because she's such a, and she's an astute, like, cultural critic. Like, she mm. is synthesizing the world in these ways. So I really am interested to see. So she's purely an essayist. I mean, that's all. She doesn't do any fiction. She just yeah, she's yeah. purely yeah, an she's, essayist. Yeah. She's a, she, um, and as she says in here, she came up, right at the end of sort of blog internet. So she is right. an essayist, but very influenced by that kind of personal narrative style. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and her name again is? Gia Tolentino. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Sounds good. Yeah. I really liked it. I think. Yeah, it was good. I wanna, yeah, it makes me want to read, read it. And I'm not a big nonfiction fan. I do have another book about women, a woman, a <laughs> heroine in a certain sense. Um, this is for people, we haven't done, I don't think, uh, historical fiction in a while, and so this is for fans of American history, in specific the Civil War. This is um, Charles Frazier's Verena, and it was written last year, and um, it's based on the life of Verena Howell Davis, who was the wife of Jefferson Davis, so if your history fails you, it was the um, president of the Confederate States after they seceded from the Union. Um, it's a timely book because it 
gives, given kind of the, the renewed focus that we all have on racism and, by extension, slavery, um, and that we've been especially, has been especially prominent in the last few years while he was writing this book, and it definitely informs the writing of this book. Um, it's sweeping in terms of the history that it covers because it starts, it covers her life, which was quite long, especially for that day. So she, um, the sort of early-ish 19th century to the early-ish 20th century. It actually takes place in 1906, <coughs> or there's, well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, overall, this is a character study of Verena. Um, but she sort of stands in for all of us in some ways, as I said, struggling, grappling with that issue of slavery and racism that that built the country. But how does that really play out in this book? I mean, you can be a criticism of slavery, but how do you also get married to the <laughs> president of the Confederates? Well, this is it's it's interesting because that is what we learn through the book with um this this book is basically a series of discussions between herself and a boy. I'm going to get to that in just a second. Okay. Um, uh, herself and a man named James Blake, who, when he was a child, and this is the true part, there's a lot of, like, solid history in this book, a lot of good research. When he was a boy, he was a black boy who Verena Davis actually... I, not legally adopted, but brought into her household and brought up with her children, um, which um, is, you know, documented fact. Um, and he is, his name was then Jimmy, Jimmy Limber, they called him. And um, at some point when they were captured, when they were trying to escape after the war had, well, after Richmond had fallen, he was with her and her children as they were trying to escape. And he was given over to the Northern Army and he, there's some things that were written about him for about six months after that, and then he disappeared from history completely. So this is him. So Fraser, Fraser sort of posits that he came, he comes back to find her in order to fill in the gaps in his memory of his of his childhood, because of course he was so little. He was a toddler when he was found or brought into her home. Nobody knows quite how that actually happened. The book has. The book gives away that it happened, but that's nobody knows whether that's true or not. And um, and then by the time they were captured, he was I think six or seven, so mm -hmm. he really didn't remember much of his life. And so this structure of conversations with James Blake, the now in his fifties, um, gives him the chance to let her tell her story. And she goes back and, you know, he asks her questions about himself. He asks her questions about her relationship with Jefferson Davis, which is, and one of them is how do you, you know, she was a very intelligent, very opinionated, very well-educated woman. She could hold her own with any man in Washington as her husband was rising up through the ranks of um, society of, of through the ranks of government he was a representative then he was a senator you know there were thoughts i think she had thoughts that she would be the first lady one day oh. um and he, she could she kept up with all you know she was the belle of the ball she was um holding her own as i said with all the men so um how having strong opinions about slavery um, about the war and that, that became stronger and stronger after the war. How do you reconcile that with loving a man like Jefferson Davis, who was fully in from beginning to end and afterwards as well? And loving a boy like James as your own at the uh, same time. Absolutely. And loving him, well, in the book, certainly she does love him. It's clear that she loves him and, and thinks of him as her own. Um, so you know, how do you reconcile all that? And the book teases a lot of that kind of, those kind of dualities or, or um, contradictions out. And it comes up with a picture of Verena as a flawed, but, but ultimately very admirable character. I mean, she did, as she had lived, by the time she, this book takes place, she had lived in London and Paris, and then finally in New York after she had basically <coughs> escaped the war. Um, and she, in, from New York, she wrote essays decrying the war, decrying slavery. So yeah. she obviously, you know, she evolved as a person um, from a person who grew up in the South, 
was part of the, you know, she, she was a fish swimming in the water of slavery. So, it, you know, and, and you see her development through the years as she comes to realize it as being a terrible thing. Mm. Um, and that is partly through these conversations with, with James. Um, so he is, Fraser kind of puts him in there. He's a little bit of a funny character because he's... We're talking about James? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about, since it's a character study of Verena, yeah. how much of James is actually in there? It's He's kind of a foil for her. He points out her blind spots, He or he questions or he digs in when she is inconsistent in some way. And so you learn more about her through him, but in some ways, he's just a foil. He's just kind of a little bit of a, a tool that Fraser can use to bring out her character. You don't like he's really... interviewing her almost yeah, to get it's more information. Pretty much like yeah. an interview, yeah. uh, mostly. Although he does he does pull her up a couple mm -hmm. many times on on when she she has a funny she has a very clear historical view of his of slavery um, and and how she feels it's wrong in terms of this kind of more bird's eye view. But when it comes to the personal you kind of come away with the feeling of, of, a, of a character who is conf still confused, even at the end of her life, about how, how to relate to black people. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, yes and no. It's, it's, it's a, which is what makes her an interesting character. She sounds fascinating. She is fascinating. So very much um, for Lovers of Cold Mountain, you will get, um, Cold Mountain was his earlier book about the Civil War. It was also made into a movie, you may remember. <laughs> So that's a, a kind of on that. Cold Mountain basically kind of elides slavery in the Civil War entirely, even though it's set during it. So this seems like it's more confronting it. Oh, like, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> if he left it out of the first book, he's it's all about it here. Yeah. And um, for yeah, I think I don't know if that was the reason because I know he got some criticism about it yeah. for for Cold Mountain. Um, but so this one is very much directly focused on it and. Um, uh, it, it's it's good you know it's good from that point of view. It's also good from the point of view of why you if you loved Cold Mountain for those scenes of the South during the during and after the war um, for the landscape he writes beautifully mm -hmm. about time and landscape. All of that kind of writing is is in this book as well. There's some scenes when they're escaping. She's in this wagon with all of her children and Jimmy Limber and a few adults that are around them, try, you know, escaping. And there are all these sort of vignettes of the people they meet along the way, which you could almost say was like a sort of adventure story if it weren't for the subject matter of the book. You know, there's, so there's a little bit of something for everybody in mm -hmm. here. There's the history, there's the character, there's, there's these, um, these scenes of kind of um, adventure is maybe the best way to describe it that happen as they're trying to escape. So there's a lot in here. Um, it sounds really good. It and I, historical fiction isn't usually my bag. So. No, yeah, it is, it, it, it is good. I think the one thing is that you, the jumping around in time, for anybody who's uh, a little bit nervous about that, there is a bit of that. Um, I listened to it, and it was harder in the listen, especially, to always locate yourself and know exactly where you were. But Is that because of the, the question and answer right? setup that she has to go back to different... Yeah, oh, she goes okay. back to sort of different parts of her life. It's not necessarily it sequential. Yeah, as oh, okay. it jumps around a little that bit. Makes so sense. that sometimes that bothers people. It, but um, this is kind of the her contradictions kind of remind me of the also real people, the Grimke sisters, who are noted abolitionists who were from the South, and their one of their perspectives on slavery is that they were so not like happy about slavery, but that they had been so glad that they had been raised the way they were because they had been raised with black people so that right. they had mm. this feeling and understanding of people and comfort which seems sort of right. similar to what she is and i think yeah and she she has some interesting relationships with black people but when for instance one of a friend of jefferson davis's who is black dies she doesn't know how to mourn him she's she's incapable of mourning she, she says there are no words for me to do that for him, like how wow. do because there weren't in that's the, so you know, sad. That's very sad, yeah. Anyway, so that's Verena by Charles Fraser, and now we have something a little bit more. My turn. Fun. Yeah. Contemporary. contemporary. Yes, this is very, very contemporary. This is a, an it book of the it really moment, is, isn't it? With yeah. uh, yes. awards listed and all kinds of things. Yeah, um, I think it's going to make a couple best of lists this year. It. Well, let me get into it. So this book is Fleischman is in Trouble by Taffy Brodesser-Ackner. 
um, like Mia, or sorry, Gia Tolentino, she primarily writes online now. She's known for her profile pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you told me she just did one on Tom Hanks. I'm pretty sure it was her. Maybe. Yeah. So everyone <laughs> check that out. Um, so Fleischman is in trouble. So this book is centered around Toby Fleischman, who is a 41-year-old liver doctor at a well-respected Manhattan hospital, um, going through a painful divorce with his ambitious and power-hungry ex-wife, now ex-wife Rachel. Um, so because of her demanding job, he's the primary caregiver to mm -hmm. two young children. Um, and the reader is kind of just instantly on Toby's side in mm -hmm. this divorce. He, you know, he's, he's the kind of man that refuses to date younger women, you know. <laughs> he is... Fictional. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. We're getting to We're that. Getting yeah. there. We're getting there. Um, you know, he's a doctor because of an altruistic desire to heal people. He's a little sheepish about his height and weight, so he's kind of just like modestly charming. And all of these things work together in the beginning that we all just love Toby. We're rooting for him. We, we want him to win in this, in this scenario. So one day, Rachel, his ex-wife, drops the kids off at Toby's as planned to go on a yoga retreat for the weekend. But then Monday morning rolls around, and she's nowhere to be found. So the, the wife does not come back. The wife does not come back okay. to pick up her children. OK. So Toby starts dealing with his new role as single parent, because literally no one has seen his ex-wife or knows where she is. So right now, he's dealing with you know, being a single parent to two kids, he's got a demanding job, and he happens to be, you know, dating various women who are throwing themselves at him on a dating app that of he course. just downloaded, yeah. because contemporary. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so there's a couple brilliant things happening here that make this so much more than just your, like, run-of-the-mill divorce story, <laughs> which I know it kind of sounds like as of now. Um, so one of those things is early on, our, you know, third person kind of omniscient narrator, which is typically how you, what you'd recognize in a book, mm -hmm. starts dropping words like our and we, like we watched Toby go through this or our friend Seth. And it, it just throws you off kilter because you're like, why is this narrator butting into this story? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> yeah. It just, you almost wonder if it's a mistake, like, right. an author, like an editor's mistake or something. But soon we find out, as these intrusions happen more and more, that this is actually narrated by Toby's friend Libby. Wow. Oh. This is a college friend of his from a semester abroad in Israel. So it's, it's, it's this, okay, it's, I really, it's really hard not to give anything away, and the magic kind of hinges on this, right, the magic right. of we this book. Want it. We don't want to know. Um, Libby's voice creates this entirely new shift in perspective for the entire book. So everything that previously happened mm -hmm. takes on a new light, like mm -hmm. shadows being lit up. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is an un unreliable narrator writ large. Like, you get this really slow shift, it sounds like. Right. It is, It's in a sense, an unreliable narrator. However, it's almost like the narrator didn't reveal herself, uh -huh. and we mm -hmm. thought Toby was our narrator. So it right. just it's, and it does throw everything else into question. And, it, and if an author can do that well, then that's a really amazing thing. Because yes. yeah, I was just read, I'm just reading the Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay, and there is a a certain. It's not quite the same thing, but there's a certain way that one of the main characters. You've been seeing everything through his pers perspective, and then suddenly something shifts, and you realize that that perspective isn't yes, necessarily yeah. exactly and that's, like that's that. good writing that's good writing mm -hmm. yes and it it, do, it doesn't you know hit you over the head with it it's right. very subtle it's very gradual right it's very it works mm -hmm. um so the other brilliant thing that's happening here is rachel's disappearance because as the story goes along and, you know, we're seeing Toby face these hurdles and overcome these things and you see how his children are kind of struggling in their own unique ways without their mom, she always remains just kind of like tantalizingly out of the frame. She's right, she should be right here. Like everything is kind of centered around her not showing up right. and where is she? Right. But the story goes on without her. Right. So for the reader, I read a review that I loved um, that called it, 
an in, a steadily increasing hum. Her disappearance is a steadily increasing hum because by the end of the book, it's so loud and distracting <laughs> that like, you can't take she? it anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's so this adds an element to the plot of this kind of intrigue that makes it a page turner. Oh, right. It's not just, you know, so it's a almost sad like a thriller at the end. <laughs> Yeah, it has an element of that, but just enough. Right. Um, the star appeal factors in this book, if, I don't think I've really kind of mentioned it yet, are characterization and style. Style, of course, being mm. the narrator's yeah. voice, um, but it really hinges on the well-developed characterization of this book. And I really don't think they can exist without each other here, which is magical. Like, I, I really haven't read a book like that in a long, long time because Libby's style wouldn't have been, and, and this ingenious shift in perspective wouldn't have been effective if we didn't care so much about the characters. Mm -hmm, right. But we also couldn't see the characters in their full light without the narrator's style. It, it's just, they work completely in tandem in wow. a way that it makes them inseparable. It's, it's special. Well, and almost, that almost seems uh, to come out of her as a profile, as a celebrity profiler, which is yeah. that the ideal of a profile is to illuminate someone else, but it's always through the lens of the, per like, you're supposed to be, like, not there, yes. but it's through you Completely. that you come into it. So it's kind of like she wrote a book using that style almost. It is so crazy that you picked up on that because she actually, Libby, the narrator, has a quote in here that I think I may have told you earlier, was that she says something along the lines of, as Libby, I realized I was telling my story through Toby because people only care about your story being told through a man. Like, she didn't feel confident in herself as a woman to tell her own story. Oh. She felt she, like she had to use Full Toby. circle yeah. back to the beginning of the program. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Wow, wow. we have yeah. a theme, you guys. Ooh, we yeah. together. We're all, um, we're all here. All three of these books. Interesting. <laughs> Wow, um, that, so sounds yes, really, that sounds really—that sounds really, really like good. new and original. Like I feel it's like there's something you're describing something that yeah. nobody's quite done in in that and done that well before. Yes, it takes such a well-trod subject like marriage and divorce, being in love and falling out of love. I mean, isn't kind of every book about that in its own right, small yeah, way? Yeah, yeah. But it completely used this such this effective shift to tell it like no one's told it before. It's wow. incredibly impressive. Yeah. And I, I really do believe it's for all readers. I mean, her tone is just like how she profiles, you know, it, it's witty. There's a bit of sarcasm. There's a little profanity. There's something edgy about her, but that edge is what makes her so truthful and honest. Right. And <clears throat> I, I mean, I, if you can't tell. You, you liked it. I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, sounds um, great. You liked it. Yes. I was trying to think of some Rita likes, and it's hard because, you know, we're just saying how original it is. Yeah. Um, but I've heard it compared to Department of Speculation mm -hmm. because, though I didn't really get into it, both books deal with how motherhood changes a woman and how how it defines, in some ways, defines being mm -hmm. a woman or how mm -hmm. it does and maybe how it shouldn't. Right. Um, so if you're kind of interested in that subject matter, okay. this is a good one. And you mentioned a couple of other people like Franzen that some people yeah. have mentioned. Which So I've never read Jonathan Franzen. So she's been compared to him For and him. also Philip Roth. Right. So I, I was trying to find out why because I don't read them. Um, but apparently it's very, it's her like insane decisive like language. characterization and language right. and, yeah. and everything is you know and, and she writes about conflicted relations human relationships mm. on a very personal level mm. so it's interesting because their voices come the those authors voices Francis in particular I think comes through very clearly in his books I feel and I don't know you know hers obviously does in certain ways because you say she's almost like she's writing about herself but yeah um, the but narrator it, is very similar to right, her right. in striking ways right. when you start to read about the author herself you're like oh okay that makes sense so oh. I think in a way it could be that too okay yeah. wow three great books um, that we're all very excited about so um, but I think that's about all the time we've got for today we will be back next month as always and we will be um, there will be some great staff picks in the library in the next couple of months if you need something new to read and 
none of these suit you. We will have lots more <laughs> on display at the library with lists to boot coming up in a couple of months. Um, but for now, this has been BB Book Buzz, and we will see you next month. So. Ooh.